What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. I'm Ron. I'm in the lab right now. We got the NFL draft happening tomorrow. I'm grinding out my official final mock draft. That'll be out sometime tonight. But I figured I'd give you guys a nice little bonus video today because I think one of the more, I guess you could call polarizing topics, but I've been getting a lot of questions surrounding a lot of these year two running backs. Damian Pierce, Brian Robinson, Isaiah Pacheco, Tyler Algier. Hey, Ron, how do you feel about these guys heading into year two? Are they safe? Are they going to get Bijan? Is Jameer Gibbs going to be in that backfield? There's a lot of moving parts right now. So I kind of wanted to talk through six of the most polarizing year two running backs, talk through how I feel about them, and then decide whether or not they are a buy, sell, or hold based on their profile, what I think about them heading into year two, and then also the chances of a Bijan or Jameer Gibbs or a running back with meaningful draft capital being added to the mix. So with all that being said, if you enjoy, make sure down below, subscribe, leave a like, let's Go. I got the juice. I got the juice. Chat on. Foolies glad I'm on. I can't stress enough. I think that intro is way too short. I'm gonna fix it eventually, but we're we're in draft season, okay? I'm deep in the weeds right now. I wanted to give you guys this video with the draft happening tomorrow for these running backs. So just bear with me for a quick second here. Now, the other reason I wanted to make this video is first, NFL draft tomorrow. We are going to get, you know, maybe two to three out of these six running backs are going to get a new running back added to the mix Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So I want to talk about it now. But then also, I just dropped my sophomore comps on Patreon. I did this for running backs, wide receivers, quarterbacks, tight ends. I think we'll do a video in like two weeks where I'll go through some of the quarterback, wide receiver, and tight ends that stood out. But this I don't know why I said this so crazy, but this is what it looks like for Brees Hall. And pretty much what I did is I go about like 25% up, 25% down in each of these metrics, rushing expected points per game, receiving points per game, uh, receiving expected points per game. Both of these metrics are just based off your usage. So based on how many targets you're earning, your ADOT, all of that, how many points per game are you getting volume wise through the air, on the ground, and then you have FPOE per game. So fantasy points over expected. So pretty much all it is, is how much volume are you getting on the ground? How much volume through the air? How efficient are you on that volume? Then I take, you know, one tier up, one tier down. So Brees Hall's elite, legendary in gold. And these are his comps. Guys that had similar rushing expected points per game, receiving expected points per game in year one. And they were all really, really efficient. Of course, it's a list of absolute studs. It's not going to look that way when we talk about these other running backs. Now, the first running back we'll talk through is going off the board per Adeko's ADP, and I'll make sure I'll link that down below somewhere. If I don't, yell at me. 706, RB17 off the board, Damian Pierce. And here's what comes up for Damian Pierce. And I have to say, these are a lot better than I thought they would be. Some of his higher-end comps are pretty promising. You have Chris Carson, Jordan Howard, Ramondre Stevenson, Jamal Williams, Elijah Mitchell, all pretty decent running backs here in terms of ceiling outcomes for a day three running back, something you guys know that I avoid. Now, the important note here is of these high-end comps like Jordan Howard, Chris Carson, or Ramondre Stevenson, Damian Pierce is the only guy with a negative FPOE per game, right? Minus 0.7. But it really just comes down to what you're comfortable with because he wasn't that Texans offense. You can say the Texans offense was so bad. How could he be efficient? How could he outperform his volume in that situation? So that's why I left those guys in the comp list. Now, I think the most impressive part is that 4.3 receiving expected points per game. That is a lot. This is a guy who didn't even have a season over 20 catches at Florida. To me at this point, it, it's pretty clear that he was underutilized. He can catch passes. Now, I don't think he'll ever be in the Ramondre area. Ramondre's 230 pounds, and he was third in targets last year behind just Eckler and McCaffrey. That is a rare, rare talent, a guy who can really catch passes. But I do think that he's not just a between-the-tackles grinder like I previous thought or previously thought. If we look through the leaders in expected points per game in the receiving game among day three running backs. Like he kind of gets put in a tier, like he's right there next to Kenneth Gainwell. I also included uh, each player's average market share of receiving yards in school. So you can see he is the only guy up here that is below a 3% average market share receiving yard in college, but he's like up here with guys that can catch passes. You know, he's right next to Kenneth Gainwell. Kenneth Dixon was a catch pa or a pass catcher, Travis Homer, Devontae Booker. Of course, these guys are satellite backs, but I just wanted to make it clear his receiving expected points per game were on par with those guys. And then on top of that, his rushing expected points per game was 9.6, which I think is the second highest on this list behind just Zach Stacy. 
He's right next to Jordan Howard there. Jordan Howard, I think, is actually the the best possible comparison for Damian Pierce, like a guy who was efficient, who was good at football through like two years. It just so happened that the Bears like just kept on trying to replace him. I think they drafted like Jeremy Langford next to him, and then eventually David Montgomery, like going into his third year, Jordan Howard. So Damian Pierce, as long that that is kind of the risk here. I think the talent is there. I think previously I was a little bit too low on Damian Pierce. The issue is always going to be he's a day three running back. Teams don't show a ton of allegiance to those guys. Now, what I will say on top of catching passes and what we just talked about, his NFL stats, his target share was better than Rashad White, Dalvin Cook, Travis Etienne, all guys who obviously aren't McCaffrey or anything, but guys that we know can catch passes. Pierce was 23rd in target share despite being just in a route on 37% of dropbacks. So he didn't run a ton of routes, but his target share was still pretty damn good. He was a rookie. He can improve in that department. Uh, if they don't draft a satellite back or Jameer Gibbs, we can see him be used as an all-purpose back, a three-down back. I do think that it is in his range to be a three-down type guy. I think that he can be kind of like a Josh Jacobs light where he has juice between the tackles. He can challenge for like 50-plus catches, 10-plus touchdowns, 1,000-plus rushing yards, and be like a back-end RB1. And I think that that is valuable, right? I think he can be efficient, He's shown that he's a good between the tackles runner or just a good runner in general. And really the only problem with him is surviving the, the draft. We just talked about it, him being a day three guy. Right now, Houston, when we look at these odds, Houston is the third likeliest team to take Bijan. They're in the mix for Jameer Gibbs. They have an implied 19.2% on FanDuel chance of taking either Bijan Robinson or or Jameer Gibbs, second highest among all the running backs we'll talk to. So that is really the only obstacle here. I am bought into the talent. I am bought into the receiving upside. I'm not buying Damian Pierce by any means. But if you asked me three months ago what I felt about Damian Pierce, I would have said, you know, he is just a between the tackles grinder. I don't really see the upside. I, I definitely can see it now. He can catch passes. He can challenge for 50 to 60 t uh, catches. If he's in a decent offense, he can do well. It's really just surviving the draft. They have a lot of ammo as well. They have the 12th overall pick, which seems like if Bijan is there, they might take him there. They have the 33rd pick, the 65th, and the 73rd. That is four picks inside of the top 100, not even to mention the second overall pick. I'm just assuming, of course, it's not going to be Bijan. Maybe they trade back from two. So you never really know. That is a lot of bullets in the chamber for the Texans to take a running back here. But my official verdict here, I was looking through the trades and at this point, I think I lean hold. It really just comes down to if you can stomach the draft. But this is a guy who I was saying to sell when he was a top 12 running back on Dyn or keep trade cut and everything. Now he's a seventh rounder in startups, RB17. You're not going to get like a crazy haul for Damian Pierce. Now, what I will say, he's a hold. But if you have an idiot out there in your league, like really the only way that I would sell Damian Pierce if you want to go on sleeper and literally go to every single team with a 2024 first, offer Damian Pierce for a 2024 first straight up. I don't think you'll get that accepted. Uh, but maybe if you send it out to 12 people or 11 people in your league, maybe one of them accepts. That's really the only way I would do it. Uh, maybe if you want to get creative, you can do Damian Pierce and like a third for like a Damian Harris, Rashad Penny and a first. Those are the, the two deals I'd be wanting to make. Uh, I would take any random 2024 first over Damian Pierce. But again, even though I found that trade on Fantasy Calc, I don't think that that is going to be on the table for most people. So I'm completely fine holding on. It really just depends on your risk tolerance come draft day. Now, after that, <clears throat> things get a little bit more bleak here. Our next running back we're going to talk about going off the board at the 807 as the RB19 in Dynasty, Rashad White. And the sophomore comps here are much less optimistic. This is a guy who had under five expected points per game in the rushing game. He was good in the receiving game in terms of volume. 4.8 is a very good number, higher than what we just saw with Damian Pierce. But it puts him in this bucket of guys where, of course, yes, you have LaShawn McCoy up there. But LaShawn McCoy was a gold prospect. Rashad White, we can see here, is a silver. Not the same prospect. Both McCoy and Giovanni Bernard were taken in round two. Like I think if we're talking Rashad White comps, if you want to say Miles Sanders, you can say Miles Sanders. I, I don't think so. I think Miles Sanders was a better prospect, and I also think that he just was in line for more volume early on. And he was efficient. You can see the 1.2 FPOE per game. So I think really your comps here are, you know, a worse version of Giovanni Bernard, Jarek McKinnon, Duke Johnson, Charles Sims, CJ Procise, Amir Abdullah, all guys who were, you know, like pass-catching specialists but kind of got shoehorned into 
a satellite back role. I think that's what we're sort of seeing Rashad White. He is not an efficient runner between the tackles, and that's an issue. We look here, and it's not good. Among 60 qualifying running backs, he was 53rd in rush grade, 58th in yard up to contact per attempt, 57th in explosive run percent, 56th in missed tackles force per attempt, 42nd in rushing yards over expected per attempt out of 48 running backs. That's like bottom 10 in all of those stats. Now, don't get me wrong. The Tampa Bay offensive line was terrible. It was not good last year, but these are like really, really bad numbers. Now, of course, he can improve, but from where we're sitting right now, I have a tough time projecting him to be more than a satellite back. Now, what I will say that's in his favor is when we look at the Bijan odds, Rashad White seems the safest from Gibbs and Bijan. But to counter that, I would say that he is the most in danger of the next cohort of running backs. If we look at the Bucks here, they had, I want to say, five visits with running backs. They visited with uh, Bijan, Charbonnet, Roshan Johnson, Chase Brown, and Jameer Gibbs. And that's not to mention the other running backs they could draft, like, you know, Tank Bigsby and Zach Evans and Kendra Miller. I think that they are going to be looking for a between the tackles grinder, and we will see Rashad White pretty much just banished to being a satellite back, which is fine. But that's not a guy that I want to hold RB20, you know, eighth round startup value in, right? You can get those type of profiles for cheaper. You can just go out there and I'm trying to think of, you know, satellite backs, but you could just, you know, get a Kenneth Gainwell for way cheaper or any of the backs that are in that range. I think even like Khalil Herbert, who's not a satellite back, but is like this explosive back. They're just better profiles I would target. I don't see, you know, we were hoping for like Kamara, Eckler, all of that. I just don't think he's special enough efficient enough right where he could get to meaningful production on under 1000 rushing yards that just doesn't seem in his range this offense isn't going to be good for a good uh for a while right in tampa bay so my verdict here would be sell at this price i think that he's a good bet you know to lose touches to whoever they draft there is a lot of buzz right now that the that the buccaneers could take roshan johnson and he would be kind of their between the tackles all-purpose type guy so things get tough now this is the last time that we'll kind of bring up like selling one of these guys for a first straight up. Cause I think that this is probably like the last range you could maybe do it again. I don't think a deal like this is on the table, but I think some other ideas that I would have is maybe you add a third to the Rashad white side and you get that 24 first. Maybe you use Rashad white as a throw in and you know, maybe you use Rashad white in the one twelve, and you can go up into the mid first. If you want to get a guy like maybe Rashad white in the one twelve. Can that get you to the 107 to, to take Jameer Gibbs? I would absolutely love it if you could. I don't know if it could. Uh, you could tear down. Maybe you could go from Rashad White to Alvin Kamara, Khalil Herber, Antonio Gibson, Damian Harris, Rashad Penny, just a bunch of guys that I like that are way cheaper and net the difference. Maybe you can get a second on top of those guys. Uh, so I would just use him to tear down to one of those cheaper zero RB type candidates. You could also use him in like a piece and go get a Cooper Cup or Devontae Adams or true real difference maker for your team. So again, uh, actually he's RB19 in Dynasty. So yeah, let me, I, I would get out of Rashad White wherever I had him. He's on the older side too. I want to say he's more like 23, 24. He came in really old. So the fact that he wasn't efficient and really didn't do much on the ground and it, it's just tough. I think that he'll be a satellite back and, you know, maybe he has a JD McKissick type top 24 season where he just catches a ton of balls, but being Eckler, McCaffrey, anything like that. I think that that is uh, far gone at this point. Now, the next running back we'll talk about, Isaiah Pacheco. Seventh round RB, out of Rutgers, Jersey boy. He is going pretty much right next to Rashad White in startups. as the 809 as the RB20 off the board. And I'll be honest, I, I honestly, I might go back and change these comps. I don't love them. He's getting comps here to guys that were taken on day two, like Shane Vereen and Beanie Wells and Jeremy Hill. I think really the only comps for him are Chris Carson and Ramondre Stevenson, and those are super, super, super high-end comps for him. Uh, Ramondre Stevenson, I, I don't think that he is in that range. Ramondre was a much better pass catcher in school. But I think Chris Carson's is absolute stealing, right, where Chris Carson was in a good offense with Russell Wilson. Pacheco kind of the same thing uh, with the Chiefs here. And Pacheco, to his credit, I will say, though, he is in the Chiefs' offense, so it's pretty easy to be efficient there. But .9 FPOE per game is pretty damn good. He was efficient. And on top of that, he was efficient running the ball. He was eighth in rushing yards over expected per attempt, but he was also outside the top 40 in rush grade, missed tackles force per attempt, elusiveness rating. He was outside the top 25 in yards up to contact per attempt, explosive run rate. So not really an elite runner, kind of just a guy who fits a role for the Chiefs where he was just kind of bringing juice through the playoffs and 
doing his thing between the tackles when they didn't really have anybody that has that skill set. The issue for him is that he's a complete zero in the passing game. You can see here 1.2 receiving expected points per game. That is pretty much the second lowest on this list. Uh, and you saw Chris Carson was at 2.9, Ramondre Stevenson at 2.3. So he's a complete zero there. He was bottom five in targets per out run among like 60 plus running backs. He never caught over 20 catchers in school. He is a, a very replaceable between the tackles guy on a high powered offense. So maybe he sleepwalks to an RB2 finish and is good for fantasy. But the question is, he's going to make his money on this offense the scheme, but it's not going to be from talent alone. So the issue is, you know, like how how long is he going to be relevant on this team? Right? This is a team that has had a different leading rusher each of the last four years. You had Pacheco last year. You had Darrell Williams the year before that, Clyde Ogilvy the year before that, Damian Williams the year before that. And then before Damian Williams, it was Kareem Hunt, and it was some mixture of like Spencer Ware and Niles Davis. So it's tough, man. It's tough to say, you know, Pacheco will be in this role for longer than like another year. And if he can't catch passes, you're pretty much hoping for it. Like for him to be an RB1, you're, you're going to need like 20 touchdowns, which I guess can maybe happen in that offense, but probably not as well, fellas. Uh, the issue for me is that RB2 production is fairly replaceable. Like 15 points per game you can just get from any of these like bench running backs that you have. The starter goes down, backup comes in, and you're matching your opponent's Pacheco. So I don't want to hold top 20 RB dynasty value in a fairly replaceable guy with not a ton of upside. Day three running back, seventh round pick. It wouldn't take a lot for the Chiefs to replace Pacheco and move on like they have with every other running back that has been on this Chiefs offense. So the verdict here. I'm selling at this price with ease. Eighth round sell, very, very easy. I think they're a decent bet to take one of the pass catching running backs, whether that's Jameer Gibbs. They are the seventh likeliest team to take Jameer Gibbs. They could take a Devin A. Chain, and that would be a lot of fun in this offense. I think they're going to add to this running back room. And even if they don't, I still don't think that he's a great long term bet at this price. Here are three deals that I like uh, with him on Fantasy Calc. And they're all similar deals where you're, you're taking Pacheco and a player you want to upgrade. And, upgrading that player so Pacheco and Mike Evans to get Tyree Kill absolutely love that Pacheco and Firemuth to get Kyle Pitts that is just insane Pacheco and Daniel Bellinger to get Dallas Goddard I love that one as well Goddard not really a buy for me but if you can do this same deal for like Kittle or maybe you can do like Pacheco could you do Pacheco and Dallas Goddard for Mark Andrews or Pacheco and Dallas Goddard for uh or Pacheco and TJ Hawkinson and go get like Kyle Pitts or Mark Andrews those are the kind of deals I'd be looking to make you know bundle Pacheco with something get something nice and then of course the added caveat with all of these guys is if you can sell for a random 23 first or a random 24 first, I'm snap accepting all of those. Again, same thing as before. You could take Pacheco and like a third. And if you can get Damian Harris or Rashad Penny in a first, would absolutely love that as well. Very similar archetypes as well on high powered offenses too. So after that, we have Tyler Algier, somebody that people really like. He is about a round more around cheaper than Pacheco and Rashad White. You have seventh round Damian Pierce. You have eighth round Pacheco and Rashad White. Ninth round Tyler Algier. And his comps are actually pretty strong, Tyler Algier. You have Chris Carson, Alfred Morris, Ramondre Stevenson, Jamal Williams, Elijah Mitchell. Again, a lot of these are going to be similar, but if you pop in year one as a day three guy, there's only so big of a sample you can pull from. Again, I would discard Ramondre Stevenson too high of receiving upside there, but Carson, like I think Alfred Morris is actually kind of a really good comp for Tyler Algier. The issue is, yes, he was efficient. So that 0.9 FPOE per game is nice. He's efficient. I believe that he's good at football. Uh, it's just the receiving upside. And maybe you can say, you know, Ramondre's 2.3 receiving expected points per game was nothing. And then he developed. The issue is, is Ramondre came in with a pretty strong receiving profile. He was like a Juco guy his first two years. And then his fourth year, he came out at Oklahoma way above that dotted line and receiving yard market share. Tyler Algier never really even came close, and it was sort of on the exact path of Alfred Morris, a guy who didn't catch passes, but was an official efficient between the tackles guy, which I think that's what Tyler Algier can be. The issue is it's like RB24 feels a little bit rich for a day three efficient grinder on like what's not going to be an amazing offense, and they also are the most dangerous spot to have Bijan come in. If we look here, 
They lead the market right now with a 28.6% chance to take Bijan, Atlanta. They have a 33.4% chance of taking either Bijan or Gibbs. So that is scary. It's a similar issue as a lot of these guys, these day three guys, they get no respect, right? We've seen it with James Robinson. We've seen it with Elijah Mitchell. We've seen it with all of these guys. Algier is very much in jeopardy here going into draft week. And I don't think the issue with Algier is I think a lot of people are aware of that. So I don't think you'll be able to sell for much. But if you're in a league where somebody likes Tyler Algier and they're not scared of the NFL draft, I like these deals a bunch. Like they're nothing too, too crazy, but you can go out there and offer up pretty much like I'm trying to get to these trades, but you can go out there and offer, you know, like both these are kind of junk deals, which I like, I mean, sometimes they work out. Like if you can, I actually, I'm looking at these now and I'm like, man, I don't think anybody's accepting that, but Algier, Michael Carter, KJ Osborne, like Tyler Algier in some junk to go get a first, uh, Tyler Algier, Russell Wilson in a third to go get Deshaun Watson. So if you can add Tyler Algier to a, a quarterback, maybe you could do like Tyler Algier, Jared Goff and like, you know, a second. And that gets you into Deshaun Watson or a Lamar or a Fields, something like that, man, where you just use Algier to go and tear up. And then again, I sound like a broken record, but again, if not, then you can tear down to my zero RB guys are like, you know, Antonio Gibson, Damian Harris, Rashad Penny, all much cheaper. Now, our next running back, round cheaper here, 1004, as the RB27, we have James Cook. And James Cook is pretty much like Spider-Man memeing with Rashad White. They're both day two pass catchers. So I guess like they're a little bit more insulated as day two guys, but they're also sort of just satellite backs at this point. There's not a lot of success stories in these comps. You know, you have McKinnon and then after McKinnon's not really a success story either, but after that you have like Bishop Sankey and Donald Brown. LaMichael James is a name you never want to hear your running back at comp two. Same thing with Amir Abdullah. It's not great, but he is the most efficient of the bunch with a 0.9 FPOE per game. I will say, though, that's just kind of how that works when you're on the Bills. But I will say there is some upside. Like, these comps, I think, are a little bit too harsh on Cook here. He was 4th in targets per out runner on, among running backs, 13th in yards per out run, 11th in receiving grade. He ran around on 86.3% of pass snaps, which was 5th in the NFL, right in the same range as Eckler, McCaffrey, Aaron Jones. So when he's on the field, he's running routes, he's commanding targets, he's being efficient, and he also had a 2.3-yard aid out, which means he's catching passes not just dump offs but he's actually running routes downfield that was the fourth highest a dot in the nfl so he's making plays downfield he's earning targets on his routes he's running routes and not pass blocking when he's out there that's all really exciting and then he's also pretty efficient as a rusher as well he was 18th in missed tackles force per attempt 12th in explosive rush rate second in the nfl with a 5.7 yards per carry we don't love yards per carry but his he didn't have enough rush attempts to qualify for rushing yards over expected. 5.7 yards per carry is really strong, though. So despite an awful, awful comps list here, I'm not all the way out on James Cook. Second round draft capital in like the modern NFL is really meaningful. He has the pass catch that we're looking for. He is efficient. And when we have a guy that is efficient and can catch passes, it's a thin, thin outcome. But he can, you know get to like an Aaron Jones type role where, you know, he's not going to be a workhorse bell cow, get 20 touches, but he can get 12 to 15 and be really, really efficient in the context of an awesome offense with the Bills. So I actually kind of think as a guy who's a 10th round pick in dynasty, like, so at this point, you're really not getting a ton of value for him. I'm fine holding. Uh, I'm not super scared of them drafting somebody. They are the fifth likeliest team to draft Jameer Gibbs right now, but I just can't see a team that Wanted to sign J.D. McKissick, couldn't, drafts James Cook in the second round, and then trades for Naeem Hines, burns more resources on a pass-catching running back. I just really can't see it. That front office is decently sharp. I, I, I just can't see a world where that happens. If they do draft a running back, I think it would be more of an all-purpose grinder type, and I think that that would probably eat more into Damian Harris than James Cook. So I don't think the upside is really likely or super super high but i do think at this cost i'm probably fine holding on to james cook because he did show a bunch of juice and he's going to be in a good offense so i think that's kind of the difference between him and rashad white two rounds cheaper more efficient better offense drafted higher much younger as well so that that's kind of the difference there now our last running back we'll talk about is brian robinson he's going at the 11 10 as the rb30 in startups right now and 
His comps list is really tough, man. His comps list is pretty damn brutal. It's Jeremy Hill, Cam Akers, Samaj P. Ryan, Daniel Thomas, and Terrence West. I actually kind of love uh, Terrence West and like Daniel Thomas as his comps. I think Jeremy Hill is actually a decent one too. Uh, I don't think Cam Akers is a great one, but this is a 24-year-old between-the-tackles grinder, right? 1.3 expected points per game in the receiving game is absolutely nothing. 9.8 rushing expected points per game is good, right? So he is a volume-based grinder between the tackles. But this is a guy who is outside the top 40 in missed tackles force per attempt, elusiveness rating, explosive run rate, and yard out to contact per attempt. He's not very good between the tackles. Now, you can say Washington was a pretty terrible offense. He also was coming back from a gunshot wound. So maybe he improves his efficiency. But as a 24-year-old running back that doesn't catch passes, that isn't efficient, I, I'm just out, you know. I, I'm just out on that profile. Uh, they're also a team that is very live to draft Bijan. If we look here, they have the fourth highest odds on the market. I think the Patriots are third. They have the fourth highest odds to draft Bijan. 14.9% chance to draft either Gibbs or Bijan on the market. This is a team that probably adds another running back to the room. And even if they don't, like you're still just looking at an inefficient between the tackles grinder. He's older. I, I just don't know what the upside is. I would probably sell for like an early second in 2023 if I could. I might even sell for any second, to be honest with you, if I had that offer on my desk. I do love a, a deal like this. Where instead of snap accepting any random 20 uh, second, you get a second and then you add one of these like zero RB type grinders. Like I love Deonta Foreman as one of those guys. I'm trying to think if I have any other... Like, let me give you guys almost a short list. I wonder if does underdog still have ADP out? I feel like they probably won't. Um, but I just want to see, or no, they do. But I just want to see like running backs outside of like the top 30 running backs that I like that are late. I like Rashad Penny, of course, Khalil Herbert. Uh, I don't mind Jamal Williams, Damian Harris, of course. I think Samaj P. Ryan's not bad. Like he can kind of give you points early on. Uh, Elijah Mitchell's another one. Deonta Foreman, of course. I don't mind Gainwell. I don't mind Raheem Mostert, Jeff Wilson. If you want to buy Zeke Elliott for a discount, if you could do Brian Robinson for Zeke Elliott in a second, I honestly love that deal. Uh, but that's probably about where that list ends. Some other guys I do like that I, I don't think I would value as plus a second gets you to Brian Robinson. But I do think guys worth mentioning are Corderell Patterson, Kareem Hunt, Leonard Fournette. There's a couple other guys that kind of stick out as like fun flyers at running back. But yeah, get yourself like a lottery ticket RB that you can just have on the bench. Starter goes down, you plug him in your lineup and then you get extra juice on top with that second. So that's what I'd be doing if I had Brian Robinson anywhere. I actually might have him in one league, uh, but it is like a zero RB league. So I don't mind holding on to him. And it's a league with you guys. So you're going to watch this video and be like, I'm not buying Brian Robinson off of you. Happens to the best of us. Now, as always, if you enjoyed, make sure you go down below, subscribe, leave a like in every single one of those sophomore comp profiles that you guys just saw. I have those for 50 plus players. Like I'm trying to think through, like literally I, I did any second year player that was in the top 300 for keep trade cut. So we're talking like Garrett Wilson all the way through Matt Corral, Calvin Austin, Ty Davis Price, Jalen Talbert, Keontae Ingram. I got them all. I got them all. They're all set up exactly like you saw before for running backs, quarterbacks, wide receivers. You get my RS grades. I've been talking about all week, but... I am going to try and update the RS grades as fast as possible for you guys and get rookie rankings out as fast as possible for you guys. So if you want access to see what the RS grades look like as soon as the draft capital happens and you want rookie rankings because you have a rookie draft happening on Sunday or Monday, make sure you're on Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. I'll have a link down below in the description. I'll have a link down below in the comments. I will have everything you guys need to dominate your rookie drafts as soon as I can get it out to you guys. So as always, I appreciate you guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next one. I got the juice, I got the juice. Cheno, chat on zone. Foolies glad I'm on. Even my haters kinda glad I'm on. Rest in peace to my bag up on. Rap a song, singer, suspended subpoena from Mr. Meaner's dreamer. Hell back asses, Loki still a and I still shake a bow squat.